One little, two little, three little Indians. Does anyone know the song? Four little, five little, six little Indians. This is a song about cultural genocide. I actually I had to ask my daycare to stop singing this song to my children. It's unfortunate that people don't know the real indigenous history. Instead, we are vilified or romanticized or our images show up on corporate logos or sports teams. You know how indigenous people get into the media? This is called the four Ds. When we are drunk, drumming, dancing, or dead. So how did we get here? Come and walk in my moccasins. Originally, when the settlers first arrived here, we embraced them. We showed them how to live off the land, showed them how to survive the harsh winters, and we got along. But then the relationship changed. And the government started to create all these new policies. And one of these policies was the Indian Act. And we were forced onto reservations. We became prisoners on our own land. We couldn't leave the community unless we had an Indian pass. And then later on, they came up with other policies like residential schools. So these schools were built between 1876 to 1996, and the point was to kill the Indian in the child. Parents were forced to give up their children. Their children went to these schools where they were taken, their language was erased, their culture, their spirituality, and they endured all kinds of abuse. My mother went to the Prince Albert Residential School, and she found her experience incredibly difficult. So when she was older and she had children, her abuse led her to drugs and alcohol, and she became negligent. And all her seven children were put into care. Me and my sister Sonia, we were able to stay with each other, and we were bounced around between foster homes and eventually into uh, family members and then back into foster homes. And then the government created a new policy, the 60 Scoop. So the 60 Scoop was the government's policy where they took Aboriginal children from their homes and they placed them with non-Indigenous families. And they did this on many different levels. One of them was sending their social workers into the communities and taking the children. Or there are ads like this. This one is actually the Montreal Gazette. It was called the AIM program, Adopt an Indian or Metis program. And there was also cataloging. So when I was three, I was considered cute enough to be in a catalog. However, my sister, who was three years older, was not considered adoptable. So when, after they took this picture, I ended up here in Montreal, and my sister woke up and she was like, where'd she go? How come she didn't say goodbye? And she spent the next 20 years looking for me. So I arrive here in Montreal, and my Jewish parents are like, what do we do with this child? They had no tools on how to relate to a child that was intergenerationally impacted. So they brought me up in the Jewish culture because they felt their culture would be better for me as opposed to my Cree culture. And that was difficult for me because I had a lot of cultural shame until I went to a school where I met Mohawk children. I was 11 years old. I remember seeing them and just thinking how incredibly beautiful and strong. And I just, it made me proud to be Cree by meeting them. When I got back home and I shared my newfound cultural pride, my parents were not really embracing it. And eventually, I decided when I was 18 that I would leave. And then I was trying to figure out, well, where do I go? Do I belong in the white world? Do I belong in the indigenous world? And where is the indigenous world in the city? Well, I did find an indigenous population. And when I did, I was really struck by how everyone seemed to be affected by either the residential schools or the 60 Scoop. I looked around and I found that our people were living on the streets. I looked around and I found that our people were suffering from drugs and alcohol, and they were just not integrating into society. So I got my education and I said, maybe I can try to do something. In 1999, I decided that 
I was going to start working at the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. And when I started working there, I noticed there was an overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care. And as the executive director, I was able to go to youth protection and say what my concerns were. And they were like, well, I don't know. Why don't you come back when you have other people who are on the same page as you? I was like, yeah, I'll be back. So what we did was we created, come on, we created the Montreal Urban Aboriginal Community Strategy Network. So this is a network where both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people come together and we try to improve the, the lives of urban Aboriginals. And there's so many gaps in services that now what we do is we are part of many different committees, social services, art culture, health, youth, education, and so on. So I went back to youth protection and I explained to them that now we are 800 members strong. And I said, we need to do better. So we created a cultural manual for all those children that are in care right now so that the parents, the non-Indigenous parents, have a tool so they can bring up their children where they embrace their culture. A lot of the work that I do is part of the network. Another project that I ended up working on was the Cabot Square project. Now, Cabot Square is an area in Montreal where Indigenous people hang out because there is no urban reserve. So when they started to revitalize this park and build the condos, people were like, I don't know about the people in the park, we should probably move them. And I was like, oh, displacement again. So I brought an offer to the table, and after many months working with the city of Montreal, they accepted my offer. Instead of moving the people from the park, let them stay in the park, but give them the services that they need. So now we have an outreach worker at our park, and he's there five days a week. So that's awesome that our people are getting the services, but the people around the park don't necessarily want to come in. So how do we change that perception? Well, if you want to know the beauty of our culture, let us show you, and why don't you all participate at the same time? So we have Aboriginal Fridays. For the last two years, every Friday in the summer, we promote the culture. We do this by soapstone carving workshops. We do this by music concerts, and you can see that everyone joins in, and they learn the beauty of the culture, and they have a conversation, and it starts to change their perception of indigenous people. So, we also have a lot of issues with the police. You have to remember that back in the day, it was the RCMP that picked up the children and forced them to go to residential school. So, talking to the police, we signed in a, a collaboration agreement where we would have a couple of different objectives. One of the objectives was police training. The police, if they want to work with us, they need to know our history. So this is the team that did the first police training. We have trained 120 police officers to date, and there will be more training soon. Another thing that we needed to do... <laughs> another thing that we needed to do was create a policy for missing and murdered Indigenous women. Now, we have known from the past that when a woman goes missing, that the police don't always step up and do something about it. So if we're going to create a policy, how are we going to get the people to go to the police? So we created the Ishku project. Ishku means woman in Cree. So now we have a liaison. We have someone that the community can trust and the police will work with. And every time a woman goes missing, they can go and see our coordinator, and she will give them support services, and she will make sure that the police take our complaints seriously and write reports and do the work that we need to do. This project is super interesting because it is the first project where we have federal funding, municipal funding. We're working with the community, and we're working with the police. And if this project works out, we can have it implemented in every single province. <clears throat> it's amazing that Indigenous people are still here today. I could have been one of the missing and murdered. I could have lost my children to youth protection, but my past traumas and difficulties have made me who I am today, and it's made me want to push forward 
and make it better, not just for the next generation, but the next seven generations. And how we do this is we reach out to community and we try to build bridges. Kita tam ahe. Thank you.